Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you, Christian. Thank you for preparing this amazing uh, podcast studio for me. Uh, I, I'm so amazed by the, <laughs> by the gear you have and the... Yeah, it's fun, man. And the <laughs> mastery you it. have <laughs> on preparing these things. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, we met a few times, but we never done this before, so... Yeah, we didn't even prepare anything. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best ones, yeah. <laughs> right? So yeah, for for the people that uh, don't know you in my, in my channel, it w I have a small channel, but I'm sure um, some people don't know you yet. So you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. So my name is Christian Santiago. I am an architectural and commercial photographer. I focus predominantly on shooting architecture, but I branch out into other forms of photography, portrait, um, a lot of personal projects, travel. And I also have a separate uh, filmmaking business that I, sometimes they come together, but oftentimes they don't. And that keeps me pretty busy. So you, you're in the U.S. for a long time, but where are you from? I was born in Puerto Rico, yeah. which is technically part of the U.S., yeah. but not exactly. It's a, exactly. It's a territory. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got its pros and cons, but um, was born with citizenship, so no issues coming here. Yeah. Like... It was much harder for you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you, you've been in Miami, now in L.A.? Uh, it's been two years in L.A., yeah. Yeah, two years, yeah. How, how, how's been your, your journey over here? Well, it's been pretty interesting, actually, because I drove from Miami to L.A. in the middle of COVID, like right when wow. we went into lockdown. So I spent the first year in L.A. like in my apartment because nothing was open, like wow. everything was, <laughs> yeah, you can imagine. So it's only in the last year that I've, uh, I've actually started being a part of the city. But last year I was so busy with travel work that I was barely home. Mm -hmm. So it's really within the last four months that I've started to like come out and actually feel like I live in LA yeah. and actually have uh, you know tried to build a business here and expand the client base here, et cetera. When you said that you travel internationally, what, what type of... It's for, for work, right? Mostly for work, some for pleasure, yeah. yeah. But yeah, a lot of it was for work last year. What, what type of work have you been doing internationally? So when I travel internationally, it's often for like hospitality, uh, architectural shoots, which is different than normal architecture. But the, the end goal is more about getting people to book like stays, like on a cruise ship or at a hotel, versus documenting the actual architecture. So it's a little different, but it blends a lot of the same skill sets, same principles of lighting, but it's just, it's a different aesthetic. Yeah, but don't blame yourself. I have, be, uh, I have seen your, the process that you share sometime in your stories and stuff. And you know, you, you, you do ton, ton of layers, co compositions, yeah. you know, it's so hard, right? Sometimes. It's, it's by, by necessity, because for example, I shoot a lot of times on cruise ships, Oh. And if you've ever been on a cruise ship, it is, um, it's its own little city. Like the captain and the crew are the boss. You're there with the client, but you have no say on anything that goes on. You can't turn off lights. So that means that oh, like yeah. there's a million different colors, like casts, everything that you have no control over. 80% of the time, like you can't close windows. Mm. So you have like very, so you have to like f do a lot of flagging. So I bring a lot of duvetine, but sometimes you've got, you know, four 30 foot windows <laughs> in a, Impossible. In a room you can't flag it. <laughs> right. So sometimes you have to overpower the sun. So that's a lot of flash power, oh, wow. which is a lot of layers in Photoshop. And you don't always get to choose the time of day. Sometimes you wake up and I'll tell the client, like, listen, like this would be better if we come back here at four o'clock or five o'clock when the sun's over there. But you can't interfere with like the guests oh, experience. Yeah. Um, so they might come back and tell you like, well, the space is only available at 11. That's all you get. Mm. So the way to solve that most of the time is to use flash and to just kind of overpower the sun to, to get a nice, colorful, punchy, contrasty image that's yeah. very commercial. So you, you make do the best you can with the gear you have. And yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of work in post, like a lot of but, work in post. But the, the first question that came to my mind when you see the to uh, mimic the, the sun. How do you do if, if you're shooting a, a room with just the, uh, you don't have any, any, anything outside? Most of the rooms with windows have balconies. 
Oh, okay. So that's where my oh, that's cool. assistant comes in, and she can like <laughs> sneak into like corners because, again, the ac- the accommodations on these ships are tiny. Yeah, they're like sometimes as small as like dorm rooms. So yeah, it's a lot of oh, like cool. sneak into that corner and stay out of the shot and <laughs> hold the light as high as you can. Sometimes I have to do it. Um, so we we try very hard to to be motivated by the sun. Most of the time. Um, we end up replacing the views because oh, wow. we're either docked in some port somewhere mm. or if we're shooting and it's cloudy or it's raining. Like I, I know the kind of views that my client want to see and I have a ton of plates already that I've collected over the years. So the good thing about it is that I get to kind of choose where the light's going to come from. So I know ahead of time I'm going to use this specific sky with this specific sun it's going to come from this direction. So that's where I motivate the light in the scene. Yeah. So you get a lot of control in that way. So is the, is the, team, the team on board uh, helpful with you, with the production? Yeah, the, the client is uh, super helpful. Um, it's kind of like uh, we're all in this together type of deal because, like I said before, the, the, when you're on these ships, the guest experience comes first. So even though we're there for corporate and we're there, doing important work because we're creating the marketing assets that these people are going to use to get these bookings. And, you know, some of these rooms on these ships, it's like a down payment on a house for, you know, a 10 day, it's like a 20 or $30,000 a week <laughs> cruise on some of these accommodations. So the, the work we're doing is very important for their marketing, but the ship doesn't care. It's a dance between, you know, getting what you need without interfering with the purpose of the ship, which is to make sure the guests have a pleasant experience on board but yeah it, I, I'm sure it's uh, it sounds from the outside it, it sounds like it's so so fancy to shoot shoot ships but I, I guess that it's you you're gonna have to work so many hours right yeah sometimes a specific space might not be available until one in the morning when it's like the only time that nobody's gonna be using it so but nine times out of ten like there's gonna be something's gonna change something's not gonna be available Or something that wasn't originally going to be available is suddenly open and like, hey, we've we've got only 45 minutes to get there and do it. That's mm-hmm. a priority. We got to go do it now. So you have to be very patient and you have to be very flexible. Do you do, the, do, you do aerials as well? Not on the ships. And honestly, I wouldn't want to because when you're flying over international waters, um, you have a lot of more liability if something goes wrong oh. especially like with like environmental issues especially if you're in another country like because the laws in like europe for example which we're often in are different so i am happy to let someone else do that but i have shot aerials of the ships when they're in port in the states it's not really my my go-to but it's a service that i do offer yeah it's good these days that drone have uh be battery life imagine a drone with 10 minutes battery life you have to go so far or something so <laughs> thankfully this was not my shoot but i i have a horror story that happened to someone else who was flying a drone on a ship while it was moving and they were trying to land the drone but the ship was going too fast for the drone to to keep up and eventually it just ran out of battery and oh it fell into the ocean And it was like a huge deal. They had to fill out like a bunch of reports with like the various environmental regulations. I think it was like in Europe. Yeah, it was. I would not have wanted to be. I would let it. I would let the drone go. Right. <laughs> what? What really? They had to fill it. So what? What if you? You know, the drone. F- well, because you're really like those drones have like lithium batteries in them that are probably very toxic to like sea life. So by the book, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, I, I'm happy that was not my, oh <laughs> my, my monkey. Oh. I always when I, when I uh, shoot international, I always hire uh, local pilots. Because, I think that's the better, right? That's because like I, I don't want to deal with the liability, and and like usually like drone is something that clients, it's never the main thing. Yeah. It's something that clients always want to tack on at the last second. And so you're, you're there to focus on your main priority, which is like the video or the, the photos that you've been hired. And then the client is usually like, oh, can we do drone? And you're like, yeah, we can, but we didn't really plan for it. Like, we should probably have another production day. 
so that's a separate pre-production process, a separate preparation process as far as like, you know, the various uh, aviation um, organizations in various countries. Like, so yeah, better to just hire yeah. someone who's, who's licensed locally. Like, don't. <laughs> you, know, you know how much does it cost to fly uh, in Dubai for seven seats, eight hours, something like that? Uh, I, so much. I think it's, I've heard it's expensive as hell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a regular small drone like 3000 but usually is more like on the 6000 real uh pricing wow yeah yeah so i mean bill it to the client yeah <laughs> <That's>, exactly yeah <laughs> bill it to the client i mean if it's in dubai they probably they probably have the money so. yeah exactly and I, I think good for them you know because you have you know you have the rules and regulations and everything but uh the US or Europe, we have so many regulations, but we're not as strict as they are. If they caught you like flying, they can get you to jail immediately, you know? And, yeah. When yeah. I was flying in Scotland, um, it was like the most chill experience of my life. Like, first of all, in most places in Scotland, Scotland are kind of remote and like just nobody cares. But the few instances where I had to get permission, it was just a matter of like, a lot of these uh, properties have like local wardens that manage the properties and it's just a matter of like giving them like $20 or 20 euros <laughs> and it's like, and then they give you like a certificate and you can just fly in the area. It was so yeah. chill. <laughs> For those people that, um, I know that most of or the audience on my channel are professional, but some of them are amateur stuff, but we're saying these things because each country has different regulations, yeah. you know, li limits, they vary from one to another and uh, you don't want to get in trouble on the air, especially. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And then also, in, if you're traveling internationally for work, um, get acquainted with the Carnet process. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's really more for American photographers. A Carnet is essentially a passport for your equipment, which we travel with very expensive equipment, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 at a time. And I don't really know the reason for it other than to just prove that like that is your equipment that you're taking out and bringing back in and you're not just like buying a bunch of camera gear and avoiding paying taxes mm. on it that's the purpose for it and the carnets have a partnership uh, america has a partnership with dozens of different countries around the world that recognize the carnet so it just makes your life a lot easier if you're going to be traveling with a bunch of gear sorry i'm laughing you know sorry you know what <laughs> i was laughing <laughs> because some of my audience is Spanish. I'm going to say, you have to bring carne. carne. <laughs> <laughs> On the plane. Sorry for that. I was, I was, I was imagining their mind, you know. <laughs> Sorry for that. For the interruption. But. So can, can you explain? Because I, I've heard of that before, but I don't have it myself. So how does it work? So carne is usually done through a third-party agency that will set it up for you. I mean, that's how I do it. I'd rather just pay them to handle the legality of it. And they give you a folder with a bunch of different pages that you have to get stamped at various ports of entry and, and exits. So usually the way that the process goes is um, they give you your carnet, it's a folder, it's got a list of all your equipment that you're taking, the value of the equipment. You take it to the US Customs Office, they activate it. And then you get a stamp and that is your exit stamp. And then when you go to your country that you're going to, you stamp it upon entry, you stamp it again upon exiting the country, and then upon re-entering the United States. And sometimes when you're traveling to multiple countries, as I tend to do on certain shoots, it can get a little confusing. And sometimes when you go to like countries with smaller airports, they might not have the staff that is familiar with the process. So mm. oftentimes I'm like educating the customs agents that happened when we went to Iceland, like there was one customs officer for like the entire country that just kind of drove around between the various ports because I think we got there on a Sunday and nobody was working and he had no idea what this was. So it ended up taking like two and a half hours to like get my stuff off the ship and, you know. Oh, oh because you, they thought that you, you were importing or something? No, they didn't even think. Honestly, most of the time you could probably just get away with it because they don't check. Like, yeah. uh, it's it's more of like, it's something I do to put my client at ease because yeah, they yeah. they insist on it. But honestly, I think only one time ever have I traveled and like somebody has actually yeah. 
being like, what's that? And like, look through my gear. And I think most of the time I probably just could have gotten it through and nobody would have cared. So when you do the carnet, do you have to uh, pay taxes uh, in the U.S. or something for that? Or? No, it's specifically to avoid paying taxes. Yeah. Because if you don't have it and they catch you, they will charge you taxes on the value of the equipment. Yeah, yeah. So it's it keeps your... Yeah, it's but you don't need to add a deposit or anything. Just no, just clean. no, no, yeah, just that, no. Right? No, you just pay the fee for for the whatever agency huh. um, you're using to to make. I'm it gonna for do you. it, yeah. But because when I, I when I've been traveling, I've been traveling, you know, in different countries, and I I would just bring in like smaller stuff. You, you don't know, have but, to do it, but yeah, if you're just bringing like your personal gear, like you're just bringing a couple of cameras and lenses. No one's gonna like. I'm a tourist. I'm here to take photos. Like, yeah. I think where it becomes an issue is when you start traveling with like pelican cases exactly. full of gear, and they see like, all right, this guy's got flashes. This guy's see got light stands. stands. Yeah, yeah. You know, this guy's not here to take photo. You know, <laughs> he's not here to to mm -hmm. as a tourist. Yeah, it, it exactly. looks so professional. Exactly. Yeah. But the, another topic is like having the permission to shoot professionally in certain country. That's another thing, right? That is, um, and thankfully, that is something that my client handles, or yeah. my, my clients, because I've, I've got three clients that I travel internationally for, and they have wonderful people on their team that handle that for me, yeah. so I couldn't even tell you like, how to begin to do that process. <laughs> If I had to do it myself, I would probably just pay someone as well. Yeah. Like, I don't want to deal with that. I, I don't want to spread you know, bad uh, practices, but... If you if you have a small job, a random you know building or whatever you have to sh shoot in another country, you know you're going with your small backpack, with a DSLR a few lenses and the tripod on the luggage. I wouldn't even bother to do anything. But it just I, might. I opinion, wouldn't. I wouldn't you know? either. Like I've I've done that um, for for smaller jobs for sure. Like I did a couple of video shoots where we rented lights locally, so I didn't bring any. I just brought. Uh, the C70, and I had the R5 at the time, and those were my main video cameras and my lenses, and I, yeah, I didn't bother yeah. like, explaining anything for that. I, I have a, a director friend, a, a director of photography, and he was even bringing the, the likes of meaning and stuff, but that's a big, I would say that's on the limit if you really that so much. But, I mean, yeah. the, even the Alexa Mini fits in like a Pelican case. Yeah, true. That fits in the overhead bin of your plane, so... Yeah. Again, it's it's more of like your personal risk tolerance because yeah. on the off chance that like you just happen to get a customs officer that day that, you know, got into an argument with his wife and is in a bad mood and yeah, you're right. decides he wants to look into your case and sees a $80,000 camera in there, <laughs> like, that then you have to explain. <laughs> Especially, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with big clients like cruises and stuff you don't want to yeah that. and it's just uh, also a matter of reputation and you don't want to look like a jackass in front of your yeah. client you don't want to have to explain to your client that like hey i'm late to the pre-production meeting because yeah. i'm stuck in customs because yeah. i didn't want to do things the exactly. legal way yeah. and look it's something i bill them like i don't i bill my client for the cost of the carnet but also for the time because usually that involves me packing my gear The day before I leave, going to a customs office, having a customs officer review the documents, review the gear that I'm taking, like that ends up being like half a day to a whole full day, especially in LA if there's traffic, of of my time. Yeah. So you bill accordingly, like bill for your time exactly. always. Anything that you have to do, you know, a lot of times with pre-production, people don't realize that that's that's work. Like the work starts the second you start giving your time to your client, not just when you're shooting photos or editing photos. So bill accordingly for pre-production. Cool. And uh, I'm curious to know, how do you end up uh, shooting uh, hospitality and, and cruises? SEO. Oh, SEO. So my three biggest, I ha like my three biggest clients, two of which are hospitality and one is retail, all found me through SEO. SEO for, for pe the people that don't know what, what, what Search it is. Search engine optimization. Yeah. It's essentially like how you rank on Google for specific keywords, mm. uh, such as like architectural photographer in Los Angeles or yeah, yeah. Miami architectural photographer. That's cool, yeah. And in Miami, I you can Google this. I'm number one. Like if you type in architectural photographer Miami, I am like the first or second result. 
Um, and that's that's how these people found me. So they found you directly, right? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and um, it, it's it's not a thing that you chose, but do you do you do you enjoy the process of shooting this uh, hospitality? So let me let me put it this way: I enjoy the process because I enjoy the people I work with oh, in these cool. on these yeah. jobs, like the people who hire me are really cool. They're very flexible and we've built a great relationship throughout the years so we understand how each other works, etc. So it's always a, a pleasant experience. And obviously like a lot of it involves traveling. So that's cool too because on a personal level I usually add on days, you know, to you know, to enjoy. Like if I'm going to Barcelona for work, I'm showing up five days early. You know? Like I did that's cool. when I was there last time. Um, that part I enjoy. The other stuff that is um, less enjoyable is just that like a lot of the stuff that you tend to shoot isn't usually the top of the stuff that I want to put in my portfolio. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not the most artistically it. fulfilling. Yeah. So the part of me that got into it for the purity and the artisticness mm -hmm. of it um, <clears throat> is like sometimes a little underwhelmed. Yeah. But I'm also grateful, you know? It's well, I, I'm curious to know, when, when you shoot, for example, a restaurant in, in the, uh, on the cruise or, you know, any type of interior space, uh, do you, how, how is your workflow? Do you work as it was an interior designer? Do you arrange everything so perfectly or is it more run and gun? Or both? <laughs> it, it's, it's a little bit of both. So if I'm shooting a restaurant for a hotel, it's a lot more like an interior designer but usually they have like specific brand standards and they will give you like a PDF oh, okay. that's like 30 pages long of like yeah. everything that needs to be a certain way. And we will spend hours meticulously staging, moving, yeah. comp composing. When you're on a ship, it's a little bit different because on a ship, every piece of furniture weighs like 200 pounds oh. because it's meant to be anchored so that if the seas get rough, like mm. couches and tables aren't like flying everywhere. Yeah. So moving furniture is a lot harder on a ship. <laughs> oh, good it, point. Yeah. And usually a lot of it is also bolted down. Just, it's just <laughs> bolted to the wall or bolted to the floor, so you're not moving it. Oh. Um, and you might only have like 35 minutes between like setups because the restaurant is opening at four and they need to prep. Guests are hungry, they're gonna wanna come in. So it's not always feasible to be as meticulous with the staging on a ship. And again, they have their brand standards and usually like it's already set up the way that it needs to be. There are, there are on occasions where I can influence it with my own personal vision on how it would look better. But when in doubt, just go with the brand standard. Like, Makes it easier, yeah. I guess. Uh, and if if you had the co the time constraints and uh, and schedule constraints, it would it would be another other you know mm -hmm. added, uh, thing. So um, how how do you learn all the lighting techniques and all your photography techniques? Because you you seem so technical and so precise. So I have a um, predominantly like a video production background, like mm -hmm. a cinematography background, and lighting is lighting like whether it's for photography or whether it's for um for cinema and i just apply the same principles that i would if i was lighting for video um <clears throat> you know find out what the source of the light is whether that's the sun whether that's the practicals in a room uh practicals are lights that you can see in the scene like a lamp you know etc and supplement that lighting based on how the light would react naturally and sometimes like depending on the client depending on the aesthetic like you will shift it to more natural like the light that you're adding might just be more supplemental it might just be some fill light maybe you don't even add light at all maybe you're just shaping it by flagging it but with these more commercial projects where things need to be a little bit punchier colors really need to pop <clears throat> they like that crisp like crunchy image almost yeah um then you use a lot more flash and you kind of like fabricate, ex you know, exaggerate the lighting a little bit more. Again, what well, you, you were <clears> saying <throat> about the guidelines, depending on that, right? Yeah. yeah. But also it's just knowing your client. Like some of these people I've been shooting with for five, six years now, I already know they like their colors saturated. 
because again, it's, it's different. Like when you're shooting for an architect or an interior designer, you're shooting to, to perfectly capture those people's visions. Like it's their art and you're just trying to show it in the best light. But when you're shooting for hospitality, they don't give a damn about that. They don't give a <laughs> shit about like artistic yeah. integrity. They're trying to book rooms. They're trying to get the restaurant full of people. They're making money. So they don't give a shit if it's fake. Like put a fucking blue ocean there. Like even though when we shot it, it was like a gray like port. Um, <clears throat> they're more about evoking a specific feeling that's going to motivate a specific course of action from their target customer. So you have to keep that in mind that you're shooting to make them money. Yeah. It's, it's not like the subjective uh, photographer's view. It's more like being practical and see, seeing the space in, in, an, in a wider view sometimes, right? Yeah, a lot of times um, they want a wider because, again, when someone is booking the room, they want to see what the room is looking like. Yeah, yeah. So there's a little bit of like a real estate photography element. Mm -hmm. And then, so when you ask me like what the parts I don't like about it are, that's that's one of them is that sometimes it can feel like you're shooting real estate because sometimes it's just like all right it's a room we need to show it it's so small right get my 17 tilt shift out yeah. you know and just stand in the corner and just light it and make it look as pretty as possible aside from that from you you've been you 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 said that you you're establishing more in LA like you want to establish more with local clients Last year was was crazy busy. I was gone most of the time. I was honestly a little burnt out at, at a certain point. And now that I'm, I have more time to like establish myself in LA. I'm working on my SEO here. Um, I'm going to like networking events to to meet like architects. I did some last week, and I'm also just kind of broadening my my potential for income because. Um, I don't always just want to shoot architecture. Like I said, I have a very heavy cinematography background, so I've been doing a lot of DP work. And I've been doing just personal projects, building a YouTube channel, building various sources of income, oh, focusing nice. on that. Um, so it's going to be an interesting transitional year for my business. I don't know exactly what direction that's going to be just yet, but I know that it's going to be beyond just shooting architecture. There's also LA is a very competitive market yeah there's a lot of architecture guys here yeah and good ones yeah good ones yes and good ones that's the point <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah very good ones so i think with my diverse set of skills like i don't have to limit my limit myself to just shooting architecture and also um at a certain point like i'm also wanting to to build more of like a, a personal brand than just be like a photographer for hire Oh, so cool. that yeah. so that I could you know make money through passive sources of income and be more selective with the projects that I choose to to do on commission. Well, that, that's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> I want to know about the personal brand. What, what are you going to sell? What are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> uh, most of it is still being formulated, but okay. So for example, like I have a YouTube channel, and I've had that YouTube channel for for a couple of years now. And I've taken it in a variety of directions, none of which I've been happy enough to do it consistently. So like I'll do a couple of videos and then I won't do shit for like, you know, four months and then I'll do another one. And finally, I've realized that like it's because I don't really like talking about gear that much. Yeah. Like with you, like we'll talk about gear. Like I, I like talking gear. I like looking at what's latest. But as far as like actually making content around gear. I find it fucking boring. Yeah. Like it's boring. <laughs> I mean, it's also so saturated. Right? Yeah, it's so saturated, and also there's like not much to say because everything's good now. Yeah, every camera's good, every lens is good, okay. every light is good. Like, so what am I gonna say? Like, there's like slightly different color signs here. There's a better roll off of highlights over there. Like, it's boring. It's so boring. I am more interested in the the stuff you make because at the end of the day, the gear is just a tool. It's a tool to, to create. I'm way more interested in what you create yeah. with the stuff. So my channel is mostly going to be focusing on documenting um, personal artistic projects that I take on, whether they're photography related, uh, client related, or video production. Um, and also talking about like the business side of, of what we do, because that is definitely not saturated. 
That's great. Because it doesn't get talked about enough yeah. because people don't want to learn it. And then they wonder why they've spent $20,000 worth of gear and they're not making any money. I'm learning the, the times that I've been with you. I'm learning that you're, you, I think you're a savvy, you know, businessman. And, and I think if you share these things, uh, people will learn. I'm happy to. I'm not perfect. Yeah. I, I learn by fucking up a lot because I've made so many mistakes and so many things that I wish I would have taken back that I've left money on the table. But the thing about me is that once I do make a mistake and once I learn from it, I'm like, all right, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> but the, it, it's great that you, you know, you have, because the, the people that just leave from YouTube, they have to create a shit ton of content, right? Mm -hmm. But people like us that we have, the first thing that we have is our service, right? Yeah. If we create content, it just helps our business, right? Or our brand. So it's not that you have to have a million subscribers, but if you have a few thousand, it helps you so much for your right. brand. So you know? yeah, it depends on your business model. If you're somebody who wants to make money just by selling LUTs or presets, then yeah, you're gonna need a big audience yeah. to do that. But I think for guys like us, our channels do more to help establish our brands and help establish us as authority figures exactly. in the business. So. It might not, like you said, it's not that you need a million subscribers. You just need the right, the right people. Exactly. The... Yeah, I, I remember when I when I was still in Spain. Hold on, this was in uh, 2020. Uh, an interior designer from Boston got, got in touch with me. Uh, just the same month, I don't know why. Right before COVID, it was February, almost March. One in Doha, and another in Boston. And oh. I think one of the videos popped uh, on the algorithm or something. One of the I just I just upload you know works and stuff mainly to my channel. So they they just got in touch with me at the same time. I they I asked them and they they were they they were coming from YouTube and it was wow. That's crazy. I, and yeah. I have like I I know how many subscribers now, but I have back then I had like a thousand or something. In 2020, uh, I think some video or something popped up on the algorithm or. On Google, I don't know. Yeah, the good thing about YouTube is that they can find you quickly. Uh, it's, it's good for SEO, right? Yeah, that's, it's really interesting, the random encounters that you might get from a YouTube video. Yeah. The people who find you, and, and not just from YouTube, but anything you put out there. And that's why I think for any type of photography that you're doing, building a personal brand um, is just so critical because, because your work isn't enough. As, even if you're like the best photographer, even if you have like the most amazing images, it's not always what appeals to people. Like people want to work with a personality. True. So you could have like the most amazing photos, but if you're a little mysterious or if you come off as like being annoying to work with, like you could be less good at photography, but you could be like a much better person to work with and people right. might be more entitled, or not entitled, but more inclined to work with the person who's not so talented, but makes everyone's life easier. Yeah. And I think having like a personal brand around your YouTube and social media goes a long way to showing people like, hey, like, I'm not an asshole. <laughs> you know? I, I, I also, yeah, also a good point. I agree with you. And also it, it, it positions you as an expert, you know, mm -hmm. when you share the, the stuff that you know, right? Well, because they say that you need what it, what's the seven points of contact or something what is that? When, when when you're like um when you're meeting someone or for the first time like it takes like seven points of contact for them to like remember you or something like that like i don't know the exact phrasing don't quote me on that don't kill me if it's wrong but anyway the point is that having a youtube channel having a social media channel that's active like just kind of reintroduces people to you over and over again so that you're a trusted source, even if they've never met you. They've oh, seen you. Oh, yeah. that's, guy, that's the guy who's always talking about architecture. I know him. I know his face. Like, yeah. He's familiar. People, people like familiar. Yeah. So exactly. building a brand familiarizes yourself with the people you're trying to get hired with and yeah. goes a long way. And, and especially if you do, you, you, you told me that you, you just uploaded a one-hour video and stuff or this podcast, for example, people are going to, I'm going to listen to the it, while they're washing the dishes or while they're cleaning the home, right. they're, they're walking on the street, right? It's a good, it's a good thing. I hope they are. <laughs> I hope they are, yeah. It's enough, yeah. 
uh, but yeah, the video I just posted isn't directly related to architecture, but but it is at the same time because it's more about AI in photography, and I talk about what the um, what my prognosis is for the future of photography as it relates to its uh, position now that AI is getting so damn good. And this particular video was me going out and shooting some environmental portraits um, in Joshua Tree. I won't spoil the subject of the portraits because they're, <laughs> I don't know, I think they're pretty cool. But I wanted to make the best damn photo I could make with my own skill set, my own experience, um, my own resources, and see if there is, um, if AI can just replace that human element that human art has and just see what I could do. Because AI, for those of you who don't know, like um, algorithms like Midjourney, uh, stable diffusion they're essentially like training these algorithms off of like photos that you and i and all of you have shot and so the stuff that these algorithms create is very good a lot of the times it's getting better well of course they are they're they're trained it's like if you train someone off of the best photography that you can make and these systems have access to every photographer cinematographer director award-winning like artist that's ever existed they have access to to learning their styles so the work that they create is you know in, in seconds is so uh, can you explain what did you do there in the desert i i you don't have to reveal the theme oh, but, I, I but what mind. did you what, what was your uh the the thing that motivated you to do this this project what motivated me was like an existential crisis i was having with like the future of photography because yeah. I'm looking at how good AI is getting and I'm seeing that a lot of my clients will probably switch to it um, if it serves their purposes because it's so much cheaper. Yeah. So when it comes to like architecture, interior designers, things like that, obviously they need to document things as they are in reality. I don't see them just going to AI because, look, they've had renderings for years and they're not using renderings. Well, they shouldn't be. Some of them are, but... The ones that hire us aren't using renderings. They're not relying on them. So, uh, you know, even if the AI can create the most beautiful image of the building that you designed, um, it's not an accurate representation. It, it gets a little blurry because it could be. It could be, depending on the prompt that you use. But I think for right now, they're still going to want actual photographs because it's about documenting. But if you shoot for retail brands or hotels, which, as I said before, are more about evoking emotions and, you know, showing clients like what they could be doing, potential guests, etc., they don't give a shit. They don't give a shit about the artistic purity. They're definitely going to jump on that stuff and, you know, because it's going to slash their budgets by like 80 percent and it's going to give them comparable results. Well, that's a bold statement, but I agree, I agree with you. I think it's the I think it's yeah. the reality of it. Um, look, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. Like I think that AI is going to take a lot of jobs. And not just in photography, but you're look you're talking about copywriters, you're talking about graphic designers, you're talking about social media strategists, um, even like animators, special effects people, lawyers. Even lawyers, lawyers aren't safe. Like lawyers, like the ultimate white collar job. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, you're not gonna have Chat GPT representing you in a murder trial. <laughs> but for a lot of like the day to day documents, contracts, yeah. things like that, that lawyers do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Wow. So, <laughs> uh, uh, what what ta what timeline do you predict that? that is I I honestly I couldn't tell you. I don't I don't know. I'm not smart enough to make that prediction. But if I had to guess, I would think that within the next five years, wow. I think AI art is going to be so good and so realistic that it's going to be indistinguishable from anything you and I can create. And in many cases, it might be even better because it has an unlimited budget, right? Like our, a lot of times our creativity is limited by our resources, our time, our budget. Like, yeah, we'd love to throw you know more lighting more this or that but we don't always have it at our disposal but the advantage that ai has is that it can shoot at the right time of day every single time right it's always going to get that perfect sunset that perfect quality of light and if it needs to flag on a certain you know it doesn't have to set up a fucking csan and you know rig shit up so at some point it's just going to create images that are so compelling and so good 
Yeah. That it's it's going to be indistinguishable. And then that, you know, my video talks about this. I think it's going to lead to a lot of more ethical, philosophical issues and questions that are going to need to be answered. But for example, is AI art going to need a disclaimer? Because it's going to be so indistinguishable from the real thing. Are we going to have to like, make laws or something that say like hey if this is an ai generated piece of content you have to tell people by the way guys we're gonna link to the uh, christian video on the description but that's a good point uh i recently saw a news article that was saying that microsoft uh fire up all the e ethical department <laughs> i saw that should... article too because uh, there were two sides that elon musk would say oh we should stop AI for six months, uh, this is going to be devastating for society. And the other side was saying, uh, Microsoft side, Bill Gates side, was saying, oh, we shouldn't stop it because we, we have to compete with other countries and stuff. But aside from that, you know, it, I, I, I agree with you. Like, it's not just all, only the potential it has to be ethical, right? You can, you can create a knife, but you, you have to limit the usage of the knife, right? So, of a gun, or a gun, right? So yeah, that's, that's the, the other thing with AI, speaking of limitations, is that usually when you have such transformational technology, when you think of things that change the world, right, like cars, for example, automobiles, there is usually like a very extended period of time for people to adjust because like not everybody had a car overnight, only like rich people had cars at first and then they became affordable. Oh, yeah. You know, same thing with like the internet, like everyone didn't have internet all at once. But this stuff is like in, is in everyone's hands. And, and I, look, that's a good thing because you don't just want corporations with this kind of power. But it's also a bad thing because like there's no adjustment period. It's just like this stuff is really good. It's getting better and we can all use it. And people are doing some pretty fucked up shit with it already. <laughs> you were saying that you, 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 your position is that uh, artificial intelligence is going to replace... Uh, it's going to change photography in oh, the near yeah. future, right? Yeah. Um, it's not going to replace photography. I wouldn't be that doom and gloom about it, but it's going to change a lot of things because the biggest advantage of AI is how much cheaper it's, it is it, and it will be. There's always going to be people who prioritize human art, tech people that make things with their hands, craftsmen, and but I think for a lot of brands, it's just going to come down to a matter of dollars and cents. And if it's good enough, or in a lot of cases, if it's just as good or better, but it costs 80% less because you don't have to, you know, <laughs> hire us. You don't have to hire, you know, if, if you're shooting video or you're shooting like a, a campaign, like you don't have to hire a makeup artist, uh, people to build sets, props. Like think about like all the moving parts of a, of a, of a set, designers, uh, stylists, like, you don't have to hire any of them. You think the, how is it called, the neural engine or the, the brain of AI is gonna figure out everything? How is it called? You mean like, uh, sorry, become self-aware, <laughs> like, no, <laughs> like that, Skynet? <laughs> you think that um, AI is gonna be that that good in the near future that is gonna oh, yeah. figure out everything? Yeah, it's all, it's already all, like like I don't know if you've seen like what Tim Tatter, he's a photographer, he's a a very well-known art, art artist photographer he's been making some incredible stuff actually i'm like so jealous of that guy because he's figured out how to use mid journey in a way that he's getting like incredible results sorry what is mid journey mid journey is one of the um is one of the tools one of the ai tools that you can use to generate uh images based on prompts that you write it's text mm -hmm. to image so there's mid journey there's stable diffusion uh there's a couple of others i'm not as familiar with them but he's using Midjourney, and if you look at his Instagram, like a lot of the stuff that he's making is incredible. If you take a really close look at it, it you can look, you can tell that it's that it's something's not quite right. Like it's still noticeable that it's AI or that it's fake. But it's so close that yeah, in like five years, like it's gonna figure it out. If he's getting those kind of results with the technology as it is now. Yeah, like uh, five years from now. Yeah, <laughs> it's, and not even ten or fifteen or twenty. No, no. I think in five years, the I think it's not going to be a matter of whether it's good enough. I think it's just going to be a matter of like what people are going to tolerate. Like, mm. do people want to be bombarded with images that are made by an artificial intelligence? That's a question that'll be answered eventually. But 
I know that as far as it concerns to us, people who hire us have budgets and their budgets are going to go a lot further if they start relying on AI for a lot of their, their needs. So I think what's going to happen is that definitely like the, the low hanging fruit of the photography industry, sorry, real estate photographers and people who, who shoot like on the lower end of the spectrum, those guys are going to be replaced because oh, wow. a, AI is going to be able to do all that stuff as good or better. And, and usually the people who hire that caliber of photographer just care about money. It's just a budget thing. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to like the higher end photography market, it's going to be hit or miss. Like people are going to be slower to embrace it. Some people are going to embrace it immediately. And there are going to be just some people who prefer the real thing. Just like there are still people, you know, who prefer vinyl or shooting on film, you know. But do you think, for example, AI... Uh We, you're gonna give AI certain information like floor plans, our measurements, and everything, and they're gonna figure out everything. You right? can already do that. Wow. You can um, you can put in an image. Now the results are are mixed, but what's gonna happen is that you're gonna be able to take an image on your phone, and you're gonna be able to direct what you want it to do. So you take a photo with your iPhone. You're gonna be like, hey, change the lighting, um, add some shadows. Replace the view, fix the color cast, fix the distortion. It's gonna know. Like even now, you can. Um, what people are doing is they're using Chat GPT to write uh, prompts for Mid Journey. Like Chat GPT oh. is another AI based uh, product, but it's more it's more for text based. And you can tell it like you can train it. You can be like, hey, there's an app called Mid Journey that makes images. This is what I want you to do write me the best prompts you can make and then you can take that prompt and put it into mid journey it's just something i've been messing around with so it's it's just fascinating like to me ai technology is like it, it literally is reinventing the fucking wheel or it's as uh big as the transfer uh, the transition from like film to digital like and it's gonna have far-reaching consequences and I think it's even bigger, right? Yeah. Than, than film to digital. Yeah, it is because at least when you switch from film to digital, you still have to be a technician. You still have to understand lighting. Like, yeah, digital is cheaper than film and it's easier to shoot digital than film, yeah. obviously, but you still have to like know how to create an image. You still have to be able to interact with the model or, or stage a living room or stage a plate of food if you're shooting food photography and know how to light it. And of course, you have to know all the post-production that's required to get the results that you want. But anything that pretty much with AI, all the skill goes out the window. Like you don't need to be skilled anymore. Like you can just kind of hack your way through life. What, what specific things did you learn in your experiment and what, what, what were you surprised the most? Um, what surprised me the most is that... <laughs> At least this time, I won. <laughs> I think I was able to create better images than, than Mid Journey was, and Mid Journey was really struggling to create what I wanted it to create. But I think that's a short-lived victory. I think eventually it's going to kick my ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and what I learned, though, is that I think what people are going to miss most about AI art... I mean, sorry, let me rephrase. I think what people are going to miss most about human-made art is the appreciation for the story behind it. So I think if you're going to be successful as an artist who still makes your own stuff and doesn't rely on AI, I think the important thing to do is you're going to have to start documenting the process if you're not doing it already, which I wasn't, not as much as I should be, because I think people are going to put a lot of value on like how you create what you create on top of like exactly. the work itself. Exactly. Um, because I think the process adds value to the final product. So for example, for these images, I drove to Joshua Tree. I shot them in February. If you've ever been to Joshua Tree in February, it's like 20 fucking degrees. It's fucking cold. <laughs> yeah, in the desert. Yeah, in the desert. And I was wearing a, a costume for the, for the shot, which has no insulation, so I was freezing, and I was by myself. So there's a story to it. Like, it was windy. I lost the flash. Like, it broke because the wind knocked over one of my flashes because... I was doing a million things at once and I didn't properly secure it with a sandbag. And <clears throat> it overall was just a very, I suffered, suffered, not like in poverty or anything, but relatively speaking for the creation of that piece of art. And I think 
that it adds value to what I did versus if you take the same exact image and run it through an AI engine and get the same exact result, there's just less meaning behind it. I think people are gonna start valuing the emotion and the human connection behind art more than ever. So I think those of you who wanna stay as digital artists, I think the, the value of your work's gonna go up. I think you're gonna be able to charge a premium for it. Um, it's gonna be like anything else, right? Like if you still shoot film, like there's a premium attached to it. Um, right now, what's happening in the restaurant industry is you've got uh, robots and AI and everything just kind of taking over like the general tasks, like cashiers, like McDonald's is gonna be entirely run by like, <laughs> by self checkouts and by robots. But people are still gonna pay a premium for a real dining experience. If you go to like a Michelin starred restaurant, people are still gonna want like humans like being their waiters and humans cooking their food. And they're gonna be willing to pay for it, for that experience. And I think the same's gonna apply to uh, human art. Um, if, if you're inclined to, to stay on this path and if you're good enough and if you're in demand enough, I think there's still gonna be an appetite for it. I think we, we have to see on a bright side because Photog uh, digital photography is so mature at this point, and sometimes, you know, it depends on the job, but sometimes you're more creative than other times, right? More, and, and I think that evolution at that competition that we're gonna have, I think it's gonna help us to, as you said, to stand up, uh, trying to stand up more from, from the crowd, and, you know, uh, our clients are gonna value how, uh, the, as you said, the process, but all, all also the the creators, the creator that we have inside. You know how can, how uh, how we 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 create the the creative project be the, behind behind the. I think that's going to be the biggest yeah. question: is can you outsource creativity? Yeah. Because the AI, there's no question that it's going to be able to recreate the tangible aspects of a photo, like. It already does. If you tell it the type of lighting, the type of atmosphere, the type of yeah. color harmonies it wants. I told it, like I, I made some images, um, you know, make a style, uh, this image in the style of Wes Anderson or in the style of uh, another cinematographer and it, it gets it. It understands wow. what you're asking for. Like if there's a lamp in the scene, it understands that this lamp needs to be a practical light and it's gonna light appropriately. So the technical stuff is gonna be there but the question is going to be then, like, is it going to replace your creativity? The idea is still king. So if you have somebody who's very creative but has no technical skills whatsoever, are they going to be able to create something through AI that's going to be better than something that maybe you and I can make that we're creative as well, but we also know we have the technical yeah. ability to do it ourselves? That's going to be a good question. I don't know the answer to that. But but, but I think I think based on uh, on the things that that I, I knew and based on especially the things that you said now, I think there are going to be less photographers that are going to be able to eat from photography oh, because for sure. the other for thing sure. is as you said is the tolerance of clients to for creative creativity, right? Okay. You, I know we, humans we're creative and with the imperfection, imperfection is also beauty, you know. It not, not everything uh, when when our clients uh, when we do photo shoots for our clients they just don't want the perfection they also want the imperfection and you know uh, and a series of, of images that not every image has to be a hero image not every image has to speak by itself it's just a, a series and maybe that's harder to get uh, to get that that direct that direction by by any AI maybe but the tolerance for creativity is maybe is going to is going to go away because the, the is, ai is going to be so affordable they they're just going to say okay i don't care about certain things anymore right well the thing <laughs> is that the ai is so smart that you can tell it to be less polished you can tell it that you want it to be a little gritty like you can add distortion you can add green you can tell it to be uh, softer or you know to have highlights blooming so that, that's why I'm saying like the, um, wow. the aesthetic is not going to be a problem. Like it's, it's going to be, wow. it's going to be able to create any aesthetic you want, whether it's that polished look or that gritty look. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of films shot today that are shot on these like 
digital cameras like a red or an airy like they have a very clean look to them and then you have people who still shoot you know like if you like the batman for example i don't know if you've seen that it's got this very gritty dirty feel yeah. to it the cinematography it's going to be able to do either one wow. so if it's just going to be a matter of like does your client like working with a human does because you know for a lot of my wow. clients like being on set is cool. Like they're they're stuck in an office all day. So when they have the chance to be on set, it's like cool for them. It's it's a novelty. Um, are they gonna still want to do that, or is it just gonna be a matter of like dollars and cents? I I think it was easier. I think it's gonna be even more radical than the transition between analog and digital because when we transition from analog to digital, it was just the tools. But now it's the entire system, you know? From analog to digital, the artist was still the artist. But now the artist is the computer, is the algorithm, right? Yeah. Is the engine. So I agree with you. Yeah, I, I don't know where the lines, I don't know what the limits are. And um, I think it just, what you were saying before, brand, uh, a brand is going to be the most important things for, yeah. for us, right? I have a question for, for you and for people out there watching, if, if you picked up a bestseller, like a New York Times bestseller, and you knew it was written by an AI, would you still want to read it? Even if it's like the best story, like the most compelling, well-written story that's ever been told, like would it still interest you? Do you want to watch a film that was created entirely by, by a machine? I, I think people will watch it, yeah. They might, because they'll be curious, sure, at first, but is that a long term? It's just a question. I don't have an answer. It's just something that I, that keeps me up at night. But, yeah. But to your point, it's huge, yeah. um, <clears throat> that's why personal branding is so important, and that's why like I've been working this year to transition my business model to being less of an exclusively an architectural photographer or less of a of a DP for hire, and just kind of creating a, a brand around my skill set because you have more flexibility to monetize it that way. You don't have to just rely on clients hiring you. You can sell your digital products, you can do collaborations with brand, like you know, a lot of YouTubers already do that. Yeah. I'm not there yet, but it's something that I'm, I'm thinking about and I'm like, okay, like, I don't think I'm gonna be able to command the same kind of income in the next couple of years as I do now from just having clients hire me for my photography. Yeah, I, 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 I think, I'm 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 impressed by the thing that you say, and you you're opening my eyes. But I think the first reaction that I have in my system when when you tell me the things is that the thing is that we've been in photography for so many years already. But I think when when AI is gonna be so present in our lives and in our business, we have a bit of time in between, right? So I think at least we're gonna be in a better position and i think getting to a, a as you said a, having a brand you know is going to be harder to break and everything goes and go, comes and goes for example uh, the transition between uh, analog and digital at the beginning you know if you if you 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 did you didn't do if you weren't doing digital photography you weren't that into the tools you 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 had the chance you 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 were dead, but after that, analog photography went popular again, right? Yeah. So it just again, may, may, I think the uh, the first years AI is gonna be like the only thing, but again, again people are gonna say, you know what? I'm missing this. I'm missing the other thing. You know, maybe it's gonna happen that way, experience right? Experience matters. Like, yeah, yeah. That that's the thing that I don't think AI can ever replicate is an experience. Yeah. And I think that's the one thing that we can yeah. provide that stands us apart. And I don't think that <clears throat> human-made art is gonna go away from popularity. I think we're gonna be bombarded with AI art, like a lot of the advertisements that we're gonna be exposed to, a lot of the billboards, the Instagram ads that we get. A lot of that stuff's gonna be AI generated. But I don't think people are ever going to lose the appetite yeah. for the things that humans can make because if you think about it, like it's just like so incredible, whether it's architecture, whether it's photography, whether it's a painting, like you go to like the Louvre and you have like paintings there that have been there for hundreds of years. Like exactly. humans have this just 
great capacity to create things that have long lasting impact long after we're dead. Like think about how many buildings, like in, you're from Europe, right? Like how many buildings have like, are still around that people have lived and died and generations have gone by. Like humans made that. So I don't think there will ever be a complete ev evaporation of the wonder of the sense of wonder for that. But I do think, yeah, some of us are not going to be able to make a living. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah That's much. Yeah. Good point. But, but I think our responsibility and a strategy that we should adopt as commercial photography is that you want to try the new things, right? You want to be current. You want to get advantage of the new things. But you don't want to be the guy that just tries everything, you know, and just is not, is not, doesn't do anything. Because I see... I see more maybe on amateurs that, oh, the new, not amateur, but a certain demographic of the uh, the photography industry, you know, the new FPB drone, oh, I, I do it, all the videos with the drone, the new whatever, the new style, now uh, the, st the, the image style is more this way and the other, and they, they there are certain, demo there is a certain demographic in the photography and videography industry that adopts new technology and new trends so quickly, but they get absorbed by the thing. I think you have to get influenced, but not absorbed. That's a, a different thing. I, I think, think you can yeah. get lost in the sauce. I think whether it's like an FPV shot or you know RGB lighting, which is so popular now, I think you have to keep in mind that there needs to be intention behind the usage of it. Exactly. So if you're shooting video for an architect, like what the hell is an FPV drone going to do for you? Yeah. Now, if the architect designed a water slide, maybe that would be cool yeah. or something that would lend itself to the kind of motion that an FPV drone can do. But I agree with you, man. Like people like adopt, like it's the same thing with gimbals, right? Yeah. Gimbals got really popular because it became so easy. And then all of a sudden, every video you saw was just three minutes of gimbal shots and gimbal B-roll and it got boring so fast. Yeah. And I think now you've got a lot of people shooting more handheld because they miss that more organic feel and gimbals are just a tool now like anything else. Like, hey, we need a steady shot because it's going to help us tell the story in this particular way. Yeah, get a gimbal. But there are people that are still with the, with the flash thing, that they adopted, <laughs> with the HDR thing, with the gimbal thing. Yeah. They, they, didn't, they didn't get out from that. But, but, are, <laughs> but, but are those people charging a premium? No. Right, no. th that's They're bottom not. of the barrel. Like, that's so yeah, th those guys that you mentioned, the guys that have the flash contraptions, like, they're not char like th they're not your competition. Like, they're not charging a premium. Yeah, yeah, there are people that I remember the HDR, you know, revolution. Yeah, and there are people who still do that and probably get hired by like the cheapest realtors to shoot. Like, the, you know, they're shooting like yeah. three fo uh, three properties a day for like fifty dollars. You know. Yeah. Do you, do you think do you think it's easier to adopt new technology when you're younger? But I, I'm asking you that because I remember when I was twenty something. Now we're almost forty. But oh God, don't remind <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, I remember that uh, for me, adopting video was like okay, like yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Now now adopt but, vertical video, <laughs> and and it's like what are you doing to me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I don't know. Uh, for I, I'm. I don't know why, but I'm. I. I know we're still in early stages, but I'm a bit hesitant to, to AI. But at some point, you know, I. I yeah. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, yes, it is harder as you get older to adopt new technology because I was the same way when I was in my twenties. Every new thing that came out, I was fascinated by, <laughs> and I wanted to to explore. And then once you develop like a system and. Uh, more specifically a successful system a way of doing things and you start you, you're comfortable you don't want to like oh, I don't want to learn a new thing I already you know spent 20 years learning Photoshop learning how to use flash like now you want me to learn how to this and that I come from a video background so I didn't have to learn video that was like what I already knew but let me tell you when like social media came out and the prioritization now is on like vertical video it's taken me a while because I, I have such a deep disgust for vertical video, but what are you gonna do? It's not yeah. going anywhere. We've been progressively using AI for a while now because all of Photoshop's, like it seems like every time Photoshop has an update, it's something related to some of their AI filters or 
some of the tools that use AI, like for example, the the masking that Lightroom does now, which is incredible, by the way. Uh, those auto masks that Lightroom does. I don't even use Lightroom anymore. I use Capture One, but I'm tempted to go back to Lightroom simply because of that. And then of course, uh, Photoshop sky replacements, which sky replacing is something that we do a lot of, like in our in our field. And I've always been so proud of like doing it manually, like blending it incorrectly, doing like the perfect mask. And when the AI sky replacement for Photoshop first came out, it was like trash and Luminar came out and I, I didn't like it either. The masks weren't very good. You always had to go and fix them. But now, I don't know what, but lately it's been, it's, better, yeah. it's so good. I used it in these images that I shot um, for that video and I didn't have to do a damn thing to the mask. So it's easier to adopt something because we've already been pro progressively using it, I think. Yeah, we, we live in AI, but we don't realize, yeah. Well, I think the difference is that in, in those cases, the AI is used to just kind of supplement like our, our creations. It's not doing something that we couldn't otherwise do, but what we're talking about now is just complete outsourcing of the creative process yeah. where like all you got to do is just type a couple that's of words. It's uh, like, that's, that's all. a different step. Yeah, so. Have you tried uh, Topaz uh, AI? Yes, uh, so the, the right. noise reduction that is is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna give a tip because I was I was dealing with it recently. I was uh, editing a few high ISO images that were so noisy uh, recently, and it wasn't giving me good results. For the people that don't know, uh, Topaz uh, Photo AI is an app that has different tools. One of them is sharpening. The other one is upscaling an image, and the, the other one is uh, getting rid of uh, nasty right, noise. And I, w I was testing the the noise reduction tool with one of the one of uh, one one image. I, I know that for work we don't need to we, we usually don't deal with high uh, noise images. We could we use with tripod, but it was a situation where. Um, it was a portrait and uh, an environmental pro portrait of a designer, and I did it handheld because I want to do it quickly, right? I, I, I had to uh, bump the, ISO, the, the ISO a bit and compensate with shutter speed, and it was like, you know, it was a bit noisy. And I was exporting, I'm going to go a bit technical because some people, you know, are going to appreciate it. Uh, I exported the, the file, you know, uh, from... Uh, Capture one to top us, you know, to apply the noise reduction, and I didn't. La I wasn't that happy with the results. It was a bit weird, and I realized, oh wait, but Capture one and Lightroom they always apply a, a bit of noise reduction by default. So I take take it all the values down, and it was even more noisy, you know, yeah. more chroma noise yeah, and yeah. stuff. And it was the best way to to do it. Yeah, and uh, when. Uh, the 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 more raw you you present the image to Topaz, the better, and I didn't like the face recognition thing that it was like a bit. It, 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 I showed to Lauren and he was, she said, oh these people look like they're they have plastic surgery, you know. <laughs> but other than that, if you tweak it well, they I was shooting at uh, with an APS-C camera at twelve thousand ISO, and it was so clean. So clean and detailed, and it didn't lose anything. I, w I freaked out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's definitely something that's come such a long way as low light. Um, I regularly, even on my GFX, I shoot a thousand ISO all the time, and it's it's so clean. It's nothing. Like, yeah. Some of the images that I shot in that YouTube video when I was shooting in Joshua Tree, it was twilight, and I was at twelve hundred. You know, which on a medium format, you know, you don't normally associate with like being good at such high ISOs, but I had to add green to the image because it was so clean. <laughs> yeah, because uh, traditionally uh, medium format cameras were CCD still, and now they, with the GFX and stuff or Hasselblad, they transitioned to CMOS, and with a bigger sensor, it was like the revolution. Yeah, yeah, it's a great camera, right? Yeah. So uh, I would also like to talk now, changing a bit of. Uh, yeah. We shouldn't get that technical because some people are gonna get bored, but I, I think, but. Um, yeah, you, what, what, what type of videos do you do? That's, uh, I do a variety of videos. So when it comes to my architecture clients, I will shoot um, like 
videos relating to the space, but I don't try to just do like architecture tours. Like I try to us usually do like mini documentaries that tell stories about maybe the people who are using the spaces or the process behind designing the space and kind of have the space as like a secondary background. And then, you know, not related to architecture, I've shot music videos, I've shot mini documentaries, I shoot branded content for a variety of businesses, sports, schools, and now uh, this year I want to transition to shooting some narrative film. That's oh, wow. like my, my personal ambition <laughs> for the amazing. year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're working on some stuff now. I don't want to say too much at the moment, but oh, wow. hopefully this summer I'll have a couple of narrative projects uh, under my belt. Wow. as well how, how how long is a narrative how, lo how long does it take to do a film oh the, how long is a piece of string <laughs> you know like it, it depends <laughs> you could you can shoot one in 24 hours or you can shoot one over the course of of a year uh these are going to be shorts like they're going to be like 15 minutes so oh. you know we don't have a lot of budget so probably like two or three days of production is probably all we can afford so we got to make a story that works within that uh boundary and when you've been hired by clients uh, for shooting video, what uh, what things have you they hired you for? Uh, like I said, um, branded documentaries is like the big thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, branded docs, social media content. I've shot political campaigns. One oh, wow. of my clients is a politician. Um, I shot three of her campaigns that she ran. Can you say who? I'd rather not. <laughs> probably, probably for yeah, the best. <laughs> you probably wouldn't know who she is. She's a local uh, politician from Florida, but you know, yeah. better to avoid. No political politics. <laughs> yeah. uh, politics pays. You know, they have lots of budgets and they have to use it. Yeah. Let's just know that. So if you ever need a, a way to make money shooting video, political campaigns, you will bank. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So I've, I've shot those. Um, I, I don't think there's anything I haven't shot video-wise, to be oh, honest. That's great. <clears throat> I think that gives you a greater perspective. And um, I think now you're talking about that, I think being specialized is overrated, I think. I agree. Yeah. I agree with that. I, I'm so specialized, but I think it's so overrated. Yeah. I was told so often that I need to specialize, and that's still the sage wisdom that people give. And Obviously, you don't want to spread yourself so thin that you don't get good at anything and you're just kind of average, but you don't need to stick to one thing. Um, I don't. like I, I, And that's just me personally because I'm a person who's naturally curious and takes interest in a variety of things, and I get bored if I just do one thing. Like I'm honestly, at the moment, I'm bored of shooting architecture because I've been doing it so much the last year and a half that I'm like craving new challenges, so... Someone like me, I could never just specialize in one thing because I'll just get bored of it. Yeah, I, I think it comes to, to what, what you are, you know. And we said before, like, hiring a photographer is an experience. If you, if you enjoy the experience as a photographer or what you're shooting, your clients are going to enjoy. And the results are going to be better as well because you enjoy what you're shooting. So if you don't want to do 40 things, but you can do five things. Right. And yeah, I like me personally, my uh, specialties at the moment are architecture, uh, video production and environmental portraiture, okay. because it's something that I genuinely enjoy doing. And those are the three things I stick to. I don't try to go, you know, and, and try everything, but I don't think there's an there's no reason why you need to limit yourself to one yeah. thing. If you have multiple interests um, now, look, there's a strategic way to go about it. Like if you're just trying to build a business to make money. It makes sense to, you know, maybe focus on give your energy to one thing for a bit just to, to build some momentum. But yeah, once you once you're comfortable with your income, if you want to experiment with other options, like but, yeah. go for it. Life is, is long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and how, how do you see uh, how do you see architecture and interior videography? Do, do you are you excited for that or? Yeah, I think it's cool. I, I like doing it. I, I like doing it less when it's more of a, like a property tour, like you would see for a real estate video. <clears throat> I did plenty of those in my 20s, back when the, the medium was still like, when that was becoming a thing. Fresh. Yeah. It was a fresh thing to like start seeing like property tours, and I got sick of them. I don't, I don't ever want to do one again, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> there are so many stories to be told from an architectural perspective. 
because you don't need to just shoot like shots of the space like you can shoot people interacting with it yeah you can shoot like the purpose and the intention behind it like i'll give you an example a video i shot last year for a client in arizona he designed a space for an artist in her backyard in a, um <clears throat> i'm losing my voice a little bit. <laughs> i've been talking so much this week <laughs> Um, he designed a, a space for for his client. She's an artist. It was a backyard studio separate from her main house. And really the video I shot was more about uh, a tribute to the artist's career. She was an older woman with a very accomplished and very uh, long-lasting career in, in the Tempe, Arizona area. And the space was just kind of like a, a supporting character. Like we shot plenty of B-roll in there and you could see the design. The exterior was very... It's a very well thought out piece of architecture. Beautiful, very small, but just very intentional. And it, and I thought it was one of my favorite projects that I've done in a long time, video wise. So, when it comes to shooting video for architecture, like you can be very creative. You don't just have to do like a, get a gimbal and just you know walk yeah. through a space. You don't have to follow <laughs> a, a a pattern. You you have to create art from scratch. You know, mm -hmm. from a purpose and from a message from the designer right I, I i've been on the trap as well when i went in spain but i want to do more unique things now because i realized that we re we realized that you know you can you, you when you when you get the dollars you you get you get paid for a thing you're you're good in a thing it's easier to be comfortable right but you have to say you know uh, you have to be uh you know ambitious enough to say you know and and you have to uh, Doing the same thing is not always the, the best thing for the client, right? Because they they have brands, you know. If you do the 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 same thing for every client, they're gonna have the same. They're not gonna stand up from the crowd, right? As, as a as a brand, you right. know. But yeah, good point. Yeah, uh, and I think if we if we uh, as filmmakers we tap more and more into, as you say, the interaction with the human element and uh, and you know, a house, a building, and also the creator of a building, the designer or architect talking about the pro project. I think it's a more unique thing that's going to be m harder to replace by AI, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Because, <coughs> yeah, because you're not going to have how AI is going to interpret, you know, the designer walking in the space, opening the windows, you know, talking about the project. It's harder, right? It's yeah. a moment in time. Yeah, I think uh, creative concepts is something that's always going to be a uniquely human thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And remember, the AI at the end of the day is trained by humans. Yeah. So. Let's talk about money. I love talking about money. I love making it. I love. Let's talk about money. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what 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 I've been experiencing not only now that I just moved here. Uh, Clients don't know me yet here, but in my whole career, I've been experiencing that for certain clients, client types, traditional, you know, architects, designers, for example, and it, it can be applied to other things as well. Sometimes, the, you know, they're more hesitant to, to do new, th new things, and, you know, one of them can be video. Uh, have you seen the same in, uh, in your eyes? Yeah, they are very hesitant. Um, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that people who are set in their ways often find it difficult to embrace new things if the thing that they're currently doing has been working for them. So photography has always been the best way that they've like shared, documented their, their designs, marketed themselves. And for the most part, it's, it's what works, right? Like they get into their magazines um, they, they put it in their marketing materials and that's how they get more clients. So if it works for them, and then the other thing too is that like they don't understand video as much. Video, like a lot of architects have been doing photography for decades, for years. They know the process. They're comfortable working with photographers. Video is an entirely different animal. It's got some similarities, but there's, there's other things to consider, variables, etc. So I think that's just a natural... Um, resistance to change that people have and I think it's also the the older architects because the younger architects who grew up on social media grew up on YouTube you know people who are a little bit younger than us maybe 
they're not resistant to it. They, to them, videos like is the thing. Like it's of course we're gonna shoot video. So I think it depends, but I yeah I definitely have noticed a a strong resistance to video amongst clients, and it's a little frustrating because video is is so critical now for marketing for everyone. Um, it's it's not gonna replace photography, I don't think, for architects. I think they still need it. But it's just a, a more di diverse tool for the, the platforms that we have currently that we use to market our businesses. I think it's a powerful tool. Uh, people that, that get it, you know, they can, go, go, they can do good things with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, the, I would say money because clients need to understand that videos cost more, more money. You know, if, if, you do, if you find a professional that give you the same price for video that, and then photography is because the result is not going to be as good, right? Yeah, video, <laughs> it's, it's just more of a pain in the ass. Like, I like doing it, but it's more shit. It's more gear. Yeah. It's heavier gear because, like, we can get away with these little light flashes for photography, but when we need to light for video, we need to use these heavier lights that need heavier stands, and then we need gimbals and sliders and heavier tripods and... It, it can add up very quickly, so that's why the cost goes up. I think the clients that, that spend on video are the ones that are conscious about branding, you know, because, yeah. and, and they're ambitious, you know. They don't want to be like the other, the other the competition. They want to <coughs> be more, and they, they, some of them, they don't use video for every project, you know. Photography is more a universal medium. Right, they they can yeah. shoot, they can photograph all the project, but the, they don't need to do really. They don't need to vi videotape every project, but they can do you know a uh, a branding video. They can talk about certain process in video, right? And those are the ones that we need to chase and in the end. And I, uh, yeah, uh, we we I don't expect that, again clients to hire me for every project for video. They have done it in the past, but it's not that justified, right? Yeah. I think uh, it depends on the project. If it's, if it's the right fit for it. But yeah. it's something that everyone should be doing, not just architects, but if you own a business, you should be doing video. Even us, like we like we were just talking about, like that's what YouTube is for us. Yeah. Um, it's just such a powerful marketing tool and it gets so much more engagement, like obviously on social media, reels and things get pushed more by the algorithm. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's a missed opportunity if you're not doing it. And it's so easy for us to create content for ourselves, but, you know. It's easy, but, I mean, I, I'm the first person to say I suck at it. Like, I don't do enough of it. I'm trying. That's yeah. my, like, goal for this year is to be better at it because there's no excuse for me not to do it. Yeah. Definitely. I just want to say to the to the photographers that are most of the or my or, or audience uh, are photographers, like, if you if you see that your clients are a bit hesitant to spend certain amounts on on video, find the the better the the right clients, right? You don't have to change their mentality. They have to figure out by themselves. Right? Yeah, and look, I'm also like I am not I'm the biggest person who's against doing work for free. I refuse to do it. But I think when it comes to video, it helps to have a proof of concept. Yeah, exactly. So you need to show like what it's going to look like. So you need to have something to show them, preferably something that's gotten results. So however you want to go about obtaining that proof of concept is up to you. Maybe you can create something for yourself or maybe it doesn't need to be an architect. Maybe it can be something for like a baker, somebody who opened a bakery in your neighborhood. Um, but you definitely need to show something. And that might be an example where you're working for yourself and you're not going to make any money if you're doing it for free, but you have full creative control yeah. and you can make the product the way that you want it. And if you have nothing else to show for it, I think that's, that's something to consider. And partnering, uh, it's important also to partner with the right people. You can partner with, a with, a someone that do, uh, does scripts, a creative director, you know, uh, different roles and you, you are just a piece of the yeah. video right well that's the other thing too is that with photography a lot of times we can do it ourselves especially architecture photography we can get by with just our assistants yeah video once you start scaling up it 
becomes way too overwhelming to try to do everything yourself. And once you get like bigger clients and bigger budgets, it's just like, all right, you're going to need a producer. You might want to have an AC. You might want to have a gaffer. You might just want to focus on directing and let someone else shoot it for you, you know? So you hire a DP and then you can focus on just telling the story. So quickly, it, it adds up into a full team. And yeah. It's and the more, the more you practice, you know, as you said, nobody wants to work for free, but the more you practice by your own, you know, the more that the, you're not going to limit yourself when a client tells you, oh yeah, I have a, a 10, 20 hotel, uh, chain, you know, I have 20 hotels in South America. I want to do a commercial video. I have uh, 300,000 estimate. You're gonna say, oh yeah, yeah. I know how to how to organize a team. But if you don't, if you're not used to work with teams or you don't know how how to approach it, things, you you're not gonna think big enough to approach th these clients, right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I think um, being able to show that you're able to put people together mm. and create like, to kind of scale the kind of projects you can do and being able to show that you can manage a team and manage exactly. a set is a crucial thing because once you start getting into like higher paying work, it's not always about the quality of the work. Obviously there needs to be a very, a threshold of quality. It needs to be good. But at a certain point, it's just more about, it needs to be on time, it needs to be on budget. Yeah. And you know, if you only have a day or two to get it done, they want someone who can manage a fucking production and not necessarily someone who's just going to be like a, a pain in the ass artist with a vision. You know, it's, it's a balance. So yeah, it's absolutely. A, being able, being able to show that you can, you can manage all those moving parts. And there's a huge potential, you know, we're, we're always talking about architects, but in, in our, our capabilities and as interior architecture photographers, we can tap into so many different clients, you know, the architect in the end or the designer, in my opinion, in my experience, is the one that usually, you know, is willing to invest the less, the, less. the least. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I think especially with video developers are probably your bread and butter there. Yeah. Developers use videos for a, a lot of things. Um, Developers need a lot of good PR because developers get a lot of shit in um, in the news. Like they're often the ones being blamed for like <laughs> the lack of housing You're and right. shit like that. So they need all the positive <laughs> press they can get. <laughs> You're right. That's a good point. <laughs> so they're they're a great great source for like trying to get people to to do videos for them. <laughs> and and it's a sweet spot because developers, high end luxury developers, you can do work for them, and it can it can be portfolio worthy, you know, mm -hmm. compared to, for example, you know, what we were talking about cruises, you know, they're paying good, but sometimes for portfolio, you know, doesn't fit as good. Yeah. Right. But a developers is like a sweet spot. Yeah. Right. Can I give an opinion? Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I no, no, you keep going. Keep going. This one thing is you're saying proof of concept, but in me personally. You want to sit down here or something? Come, come. <laughs> oh, we had the boss. We had the boss, and you know, here with us. <laughs> We're gonna end up the podcast with Lauren. Lauren Nagel, Hi. My wife and I just jumped in. Our partner, unfortunately. So, I just hold it like that, right? Yeah. So we were. You were talking. Talking. Earlier. Talking to the oh, mic. Oh, so you were talking. Okay. <laughs> Not that close. So you were talking earlier about proof of concept, and one thing that I did in a different industry was I was really into electronic music, and I realized at that time a lot of musicians were just so obsessed with getting it in blogs, and I was kind of one of the first electronic YouTube channels that just did interviews, walking and talking, but video format on YouTube. and. Early on, some of my videos got 100,000 views, and I know for sure that that doesn't compete with any blogs. I could, there's no way an EDM blog is gonna get 100,000 views at this point. So I think for us as well, we have to be the people who are, why don't we put our videos on YouTube, do really, really good SEO, and they get 50,000 views. I did one video that was really bad, but I keyworded it crazy with mid-century terms, and that's what people search for. And I think that one has over 10,000, I can't remember why I checked, but that would be good for us to send to clients, like, look at this, it got 10,000. I'm curious about the circulation for, I mean, 
I don't, I actually don't know what the circulation for AD is or dwell. It would be interesting for us to see digitally because most of our clients aren't getting into print unless they're really a, a list. I mean, maybe some people watching, but for the most part, just going for the digital version is already good enough for them. And I think if we can top off the digital version with more eyeballs, that's going to say something. Plus, it's their brand. If it's their own YouTube channel, they don't have to go through a pure agency, which they're paying thousands for. They can circumvent all these other third parties. But we have to do it our, ourselves. Our, you, I haven't seen really any videographer on YouTube that has a very maximized videos that it's some real estate. I mean, I commend them. Some of the real estate photographer, uh, videographers are getting a lot of views, even just putting an address. I mean, can you imagine if they actually tried to do keywords mm -hmm. about the style of the house that people yeah, we search were for? Talking about SEO before. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah but right. we're not doing it ourselves. So that, that yeah. was <laughs> well, I always say ph photographers are the worst people at marketing themselves because it's always it's such a different skill set, like being a creative, being an, an artist and being a business person, it's like almost too just um, when polar opposites, when magnets don't click, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I agree with you. I think if for no other reason, you should do the video for yourself, make it for your business. And that's your proof of concept. Yeah. And like, just send it to them. Look, this got 30K. Yeah. What yeah. are you going to get on 12? Like, yeah. <laughs> not, I, don't, I don't care. I would just send it like. Okay, that's what happened when when you when the when you bring the wife on set, the the wife uh, jumps into the podcast. Sorry, guys. She should she should have been on it like from the start. I no, think. no, it's fine. For one time that she's not, it's fine. Uh, I'm, we're okay. We're gonna have uh, her the other uh, the next time. But she yeah she has so many stories. She's uh, super interesting. But. Cool. Uh, so is there anything else that you want to talk about no, before think, we go? I think we covered a lot of stuff today. Yeah, right? Yeah, like, and my voice is kind of shot at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you. This where, where, where people can find you? So you can follow me on Instagram at C Santiago Photo. My website is csantiagophoto.com. Pretty much any variation of C Santiago Photo is going to lead you somewhere on the internet that relates to me. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, man. <laughs> Right. How, how how can you how you how you do like that like that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Just the improvise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. With a phone or something.